I was very interested in the comparison that you were making, or the links that you were making with the 18th, 19th century freak shows um, in terms of content and spectacle and what we see on YouTube. And I was wondering whether you could just expound on that a little bit. Because I was thinking that, for example, you know, YouTube is the one place that you could search to see something like, you know, Saddam Hussein's, you know, hanging or something along those lines. You would never be able to see that um, on any other sort of media site. So uh, wh what were you thinking about when you were making that comparison between the 18th and 19th century freak show? That's a great question. Well, it was coming out of my teaching. Um, I love Alex's work because it kind of faces head on the role of YouTube in teaching. I teach digital, digital media studies and we talk about YouTube as a form of broadcasting, certainly, but also as a way for people to learn about difference, because I also teach ethnic studies, not actually in the same class, but that's what my area of research is. And I had a little clip of Antoine Dodson because I thought that there was a way that Antoine Dodson was viewed kind of as a freak and people made fun of him. I know that his costume was the most popular Halloween costume or one of the most popular Halloween costumes this year. And the discussion sections in my class um, had a debate about whether they thought the way he was remixed on auto-tune and the way he was consumed as a spectacle on YouTube was in fact racist or not. Um, and I wanted to put the freak show clips in there because it's so obvious to us now when we look at those archival footages from YouTube that that was wrong, right? That those poor people who, you know, had what we would probably call now disabilities or birth defects were displaying themselves for money in order to make a living. And Dodson did get paid, but people also wanted to debate how much he should get paid, you know, whether he was... In some ways, in a freak show, people voluntarily submit to being viewed and sometimes laughed at. But on YouTube, it's not always voluntary. It's not something you can control or take down on your own. So that was a kind of the darker side of YouTube or how it's been used, um, that it can be kind of an empty spectacle. People talk about it as time-wasting, but it's not just empty. Sometimes it really can be kind of objectifying and um, racist or sexist or otherwise really bad. But in, the other, in another sense, what's great about YouTube is that we could talk about this in class because it was there forever. And I didn't have to worry about it going away, and I knew a lot of people had seen it, and so it was a common ground for us to try and examine as part of our popular culture. So that's what I was thinking about. And also the John Leonio's video I liked a lot because it was so gothic and so dark and so much about racism and empire and various kinds of violence that have happened. And um, it was a way to provoke a conversation. So it wasn't itself a conversation. It was a way to start a conversation, which is what I think YouTube is good for in the context of teaching. You were referencing in your film one of the earlier films that took part in this exhibition, the Kara Ke Keating um, film. And I thought that was very interesting. I think you're one of the only uh, presenters during the entire duration of the show that has actually referenced a film that has already been made. Um, and I wondered whether you could talk a little bit about why you thought it was important to do that. Um, and it also, the second to that, I wondered whether you had made your film or your contribution after the Kara Keating, Keating film, which wasn't that long ago. It was only, I think, a couple of weeks ago that we shared Yeah, it's, it, I'm very flattered that you call what I put up a film because I've never put anything up on YouTube in my life. Though I have made very, very many PowerPoint lectures for my classes that had clips in them, I've never actually put anything up on YouTube. So that was an interesting experience to do and, and know that it's public and people are gonna see it. Um, I felt that my role, since I'm not an artist and I don't make original work that way, was to comment on original work that other people made. But that's what YouTube is for, in a way, right? It's got a remix button, it's got a commentary button, it's kind of discursive, so I didn't feel like it would be wrong to take or quote from people, because that's what scholars do, is to take and quote from people. In this case, I was quoting from video, but using something like Final Cut, the process looks a lot like writing. It's a lot like cutting and pasting and putting things in order and shuffling things around. So um, we have a course at our university called Writing with Video, and I think that's the kind of writing or the kind of 
persuasion or um, intellectual production that a lot of people my age have trouble doing and are, are going to have to learn. So um, another person put up some, another artist in the show put up a video of that his student had made about a public figure in England who had been a colonial kind of slave trader and also had built large parts of the city. And I think he wanted to cite his students' work to show that that's what students are doing now is, you know, doing their academic work through video. So um, teachers complain, how am I going to grade that? I don't know how to assess it or, you know, whether it's good or bad. But I think that's totally wrong. You can absolutely tell whether it's good or bad. And the one she put up was really good. I don't know how old she was, but it was had as much of an argument and was at least as coherent as most things that I read. So I'm really interested in what the students had to think about this, um, whether you think that's an a alternative you'd like to have um, with your work as a student and whether you think that's something you'd like to see your, your teachers do a little more of or you know, what you're thinking is about YouTube for teaching. D does anybody want to respond to that? Um, okay, well, this isn't uh, exactly YouTube, but I know there is this one guy who started um, videotaping himself teaching like calculus or I forget what his name is but um, so some of the schools in California have started to use that so the kids that will go home and watch the videos and then when they come to school the teachers will help them with the homework so it's sort of like the opposite of what we're doing which is like um, learning in class and then doing homework so they're doing homework in class and then learning at home so I thought that was a cool idea, and um, I sort of understand that because, like, with something like calculus, in class you really seem to understand it, but when you go home you can be really lost, and you're like, what the heck am I doing? I don't understand this at all. So I think it's a pretty cool concept. Um, I think that it'd be cool to try it. I think it might be harder for classes like history, um, but, like, for things like math, um, where teachers can really help you, understand it in class and you can learn it outside of class too. Um, it'd be a cool thing to try, so. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I don't know how to make videos. I just had a, I had a um, MFA student help me with this video. He was the one who did most of the Final Cut stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, I told him what to put in and I talked and he filmed me. But I asked other people who are professors of digital media what's the best way to learn and they all said um, take the online classes. Yeah. Because you can stop it when you get confused and then figure out what you need to do and then go back and you can rewind it a million times. But a human being doesn't want to repeat things a million times. Right. So you can go at your own pace, which is nice. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a ton better. And so school would be more like workshops. Yeah. You know, or more interactive with the teacher rather than you sitting there and listening, which is a lot better. You know, school is boring. <laughs> I think that's why this YouTube project is got an education side is that if school doesn't get less boring, everyone's going to be really dumb in the future, right? You know, yeah. it's really hard to teach people stuff when they're half asleep. And in my class, I tell my students, I know I'm competing for your attention with your laptop. Some people are overtly playing Counter-Strike while I'm giving my lecture or on Facebook. And I don't even front about it. I just say, okay, I know that I'm competing with that and I'm not going to win because that is a lot more interesting. Like you can go at your own pace. But you should listen because what we're talking about is why that's more interesting. All right, that's our, our class is why is this more interesting? It's because you have more agency and you're not just sitting there and having to consume it and then getting lost. And once you're lost, you're lost, right? It's, yeah. That's it's it. So um, anyway, yeah, thanks for your comment. I didn't know that. I think that's a cool way to teach. Hi, um, my name is Evan. I'm a third year. Um, so I had two classes uh, and for their final project, instead of writing a sort of academic paper, um, it was more opened up to artistic imp uh, like expression. Um, and so I think the idea basically was to make some sort of film or some sort of media clip um, that would be more, uh, I guess, democratic, and ideally it would be uploaded into YouTube. And so the first class was an art history class, um, black aesthetics and political representation, and the second class was a history class, um, which was all power to the people. So they were both ethnic studies oriented um, in some ways, and I guess part of like the ethnic studies pedagogy is like that you would take this information that you learn in the academy um, and spread it to, a, you know, I guess a more democratic audience that might not necessarily have access uh, to education. Um, and so, I, I mean, I, th I think that experience was good for me um, as someone who, uh, I mean, I, like, 
likes writing academic papers, um, but is also an artist. Like I think it was interesting, how do I express myself um, in both of those ways? Yeah, I would, you know, in, in my fantasy world, being an artist and having an academic side, an intellectual side, would not be as divided from each other as they are now. And I think that's the way it's, it's going to have to go. And so people your age are doing both of those things and melding those practices together. Um, what worries me is that people my age and older are not doing that, and we're the ones who are probably in charge of most of the time that you are spending in college. So um, I'm glad you brought up ethnic studies, particularly the idea of making some kind of public service type of artistic expression through video is really important because I think so many people watch YouTube and don't get a chance to talk about the racism they see there and aren't really sure what it is. So I'm not going to out anybody in my class, but let me just say, I asked my students to tell me their favorite videos on YouTube so I could screen them when they walk in. So some people have intro music, just the students have something to listen to when they're waiting for you to start or waiting for their students. So I decided I'd play YouTube videos. So um, I played uh, People Are Awesome, which is about stunts and you know people doing crazy things with their bodies. And I play Double Rainbow, which is about a guy freaking out about a rainbow. And then I looked at all the student ones, and two people wanted to do one called Leprechaun in Alabama. Have you seen this one? No. Heard of it? It's really popular. It's got like 23 some odd million. Has anybody in the room seen this one? Is it Leprechaun in Alabama? What's it called? Leprechaun in Alabama. Oh, I think I've seen it. <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk about it? Yes. <laughs> um, I guess it's like a, like, a, like an urban suburb, and it's like people think that they're seeing a leprechaun in the trees every night, but anytime they look at it, they can't find it. <laughs> um, and then. And then it's just interviews with like the entire city being like, there's a leprechaun, we know it, we've seen it, <laughs> but no one else can see it. <laughs> yeah, and it just, it, I guess it's a, like a Fox News interviews with the town. Yeah. It's really funny, to be honest, it's hilarious. Um, people go crazy about it. <laughs> it you just don't get it? Double Rainbow's funny. Leprechaun, but I don't understand. So, you know, everybody wants to know how do these things get viral, what makes them popular, and so on. Um, but what's interesting to me is that for a lot of people who live in very monoracial communities, this may be, you know, an experience of blackness that they're not interpreting very well, right? So I've seen some comments about it saying that are very racist, saying these people are so stupid, how can black people be so dumb? And I think, oh, God. You know, here's a conversation about race that's happening, and it's not happening well, you know? So wouldn't it be good if there were some way we could talk about this in a critical way or maybe intervene in how people are interpreting this video, you know? Like you say, it's just funny because, you know, it's so silly. A lot of YouTube stuff is silly. Um, but the reason I put in the Antoine Dodson thing is that that was silly too, but a lot of people in the black community were really offended because they, they said it just is minstrelsy. You know, people are laughing at him because of this caricatured kind of racial performance of blackness and they felt very, very insulted by it. Other people didn't understand what they were talking about. And so um, this is something we talk about in my class because the students don't know what to think of it, but they all know they feel vaguely guilty about it in some way. That it doesn't really, really feel right to laugh about it, but it's also so interesting and so compelling, you have to watch it anyway. So, well, thanks for your input. No problem. <laughs> so, uh, Lisa, we're trying to keep these discussions down to about uh, 10 minutes. Okay. So uh, that we can put them on YouTube. So if there's any final comments from the floor, then maybe. Okay, so thank you very, very much for your contribution to Perpetube. Um, it was really wonderful, and thanks so much for being available for uh, answer, uh, question and answer session afterwards. Thank and it's you, a great... Thank you, audience, thank you. for coming. Yes. And it was a great way to finish the show, so thank you very much. Okay. okay.